welcome back to Riders of the Dawn. Who am I? Um, are you? Alright, I'm some white guy and Jay is some other white guy. Bald white guy. Yeah. Okay. So, um, welcome back. I think we're going to do one more on self-publishing. We're going to get into the nitty-gritty of costs yeah. and pricing is I think what we, what we want to do today. And this is... I, I, I can't give you any more information than what we've given you in like four podcasts to help you make decisions about how to self-publish and, and that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, Otherwise, it's just... You got you to gotta get down deep into your elbows working on it to... Uh, and you'll have more questions, but you, you'll probably find the answers on your own because every every situation is going to be slightly different. Yeah, and you got to learn by doing. Yep. The, the, the only true baptism is by fire. And you have to kind of approach the business as like, I'm going to learn this by doing this. And that's exactly what I did and am doing. Yeah. Uh, so, like, you're learning with me. <laughs> yeah. um, so, I, I recorded an audiobook. So, let's, let's talk about, we'll talk about pricing, we'll talk about audiobooks, we'll, well talk let's, about paperbacks. Let's start with ebooks first because e -books. I think okay. that's where everyone's going to get started. Okay. So, a lot of people put out an ebook and they see how much work that went into it and they think they should charge a lot of money for it. Mm -hmm. Or they're like, hey, um, you know, Steven Erickson charges nine ninety nine for his ebooks. Right. I uh, should charge nine ninety nine for my ebooks. You're not Steven Erickson. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're not Stephen King. You're not Stephen. But even then, if you were to go look at Stephen Erickson's price points, the publisher knows a little bit of what they're doing. I'm pretty. I'm sure he's he's with Daw or someone. Anyway. Um, yeah. Or Ace. Yeah, when he's with, he's one, with of those. one of those. So if you look at if you look at Malazan Book of the Fallen, the first Malazan book is like one ninety nine. Yeah. Ninety nine cents. What? That's a huge book. How would he sell because there's ten books in the series and the idea is you wanna you wanna get people in the series and then they're gonna be a lot more willing to shell out the dough for the ebook later on. Yeah, for the for the, for the other ten, books. For the nine ninety by the time yeah. they get to Bone Hunters, they're gonna be they're gonna look at that ten ninety nine ebook and they're like, I really wanna know what happens. Yeah, I gotta know what happens. I'm gonna pay ten ninety nine. I'm gonna pay ten ninety nine and I'm gonna buy the Audible. Yeah. And because yeah. I, I say that because I did that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You so know? um so and that, that that's that's something you gotta keep in mind. You can have higher prices for later books in a series if you're writing a series. Um, right now, a lot of guys are into writing series, and a lot of readers are into reading series because they like longer. They like to know the characters longer than one story. Yeah. Uh, I get a lot of requests for Muramasa sequels, and it's just because people love the characters. Yeah. They thought the characters were really cool and interesting, and they wanted to know them more. And um, and I understand that. And it, it would, if I did another story, it would be you know, you get to know more of the characters. Uh, but it'd be a new story, yeah. and so you get sort of two two things you like: new story and characters you've already invested in. Yeah. Um, and now traditional publishers will tell you right off the bat: don't don't write a series as your first book. Um, and there's there's some good reasons for that, but then as an indie publisher, you also have some incentives to do the opposite. Yeah, um, actually, I I think you can just I, I think we've said to not do that in the past. I'm gonna say I'm gonna totally contradict myself. Say so you're totally okay doing that if you're going on your on your own, provided that you approach it with the right mm -hmm. mindset and the right understanding of, of how you're going to yeah. market that. And and the way I would approach that is, if you're if you're pretty new to this and you've got a story in mind, really love your characters, write the first book as though it's going to be a, a single function. And I think a great example is Stormfront. Yes. First Jim Butcher book. First Jim Butcher great. book. You look at that and it's it can stand on its own. It could be its um, own book. You don't need any more than what's in the book to enjoy the story that's in yeah. the book. And okay. actually the first three. Each uh, one of those are very, yeah. Yeah, the separate. first three are you can read them in any order. Um, and it doesn't it doesn't affect the yeah. story. Yeah, I mean well, I mean it's yeah, you know, he does a pretty good job. Like in full moon, you don't you really don't need to you don't need to know what happens in the in, in the, the first book. book. You just really don't. Um, because point. he he does he does a good job um, rehashing anything that you would need to know. And and again, that from a from a publisher's perspective, I think that that's a good idea because you want you want we talk about uh, consumer confidence. So if you start off writing a series, 
and when people go to look at your Amazon author page, they only see one book, and it's like, book one of this epic fantasy, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of roast myself here, so, uh, my, my ebook is 99 cents, and it's book one of an epic fantasy series, so, uh, the consumer confidence isn't there to, to take a chance on, on a series when they know that the story's not complete, so if you, if you set out with your first book being a standalone book with, with the potential in my, like, you don't kill your main character, right? The end of the book is, doesn't result in your main character dying, right? You can write a sequel out, off of that. You can write um, a series off of that. And then if you're like Jim Butcher, you can, um, you can take that and put it into, uh, you know, after three books is when he really started to develop this big arc, big arc where, you know, he's, he's said for, for a long time now, it's like, it's going to be a 20 book series. And then after the 20 books, there's going to be a three book trilogy of the apocalypse. Uh, <laughs> so he knows what's happening and God bless him. I'm still waiting for, for the next book. Yeah. Tw 20 <laughs> books is intense. Um, so, and actually we mentioned, uh, Malazan book of the fallen. The first, I would say the first, maybe even the first, like five books, each of those is like a separate thing and doesn't like they are they're all really connected and the setting is really connected but each one of those is kind of self-contained like gardens of the moon you can get to gardens of the moon and be like that was a great book and not and, yeah, not yeah. have to pick up another one mm -hmm. um you could get to the end of of uh dead house gates i can't imagine someone getting into dead, dead house gates and liking it and saying like i don't need to read another one yeah at the end of dead, dead house, house gates, gates was pretty much so like, good you're pretty much like <laughs> i got it you know you look you look on amazon for more erickson and you see there's a third book you immediately pick it up um that's and so again if you if you can self-contain your first book that's good um i look at uh brandon sanderson um a lot of people don't like elantris i i liked it i liked it a lot actually but what I will say is the first half of the book feels amateurish, and then the second half of the book is where he really figured himself out, and the second half of Elantris is really good. This happens when you're when you're not that experienced, is that you get better at writing by the time you get to the end of the book. <laughs> yeah. And it like I've I've experienced this where I like got to three word three hundred thousand and I was like, word word one thousand sucks. I need yeah. to, and so I had to do page one, and that, that book still hasn't come out. Um, yeah. Anyway, so let's get back to the price points. Um, what, right. sh what should you probably price your book at if you're new? The answer is 99 cents or less. If you go on Amazon, 99 cents is the lowest. Uh-oh, how do you get it lower than 99 cents? Well, you have to do kind of a... Kind of a workaround. Yeah, it's kind, kind of, of a shady thing, yeah. Um, so have you, you figured out how to do this? Because I, I haven't yes. really looked into it. So, you, first of all, you can't have your book on KDP Select. <clears throat> so you have to opt out of that. Uh, because if you don't, you're going to lose access to that. And you want, you really want access to KDP Select for books that you can actually get people to read. Yeah. Um, but for the, maybe your first book, you don't, you may want to have it on what's called Permafree. And um, you put it up on Amazon for 99 cents, but then you put it up on Smashwords with a zero dollar price tag. And then you and, price match, right? And then you tell Amazon that your book's available from another seller for less money, and they price match. And so then it'll just be zero dollars. It'll be free, a free ebook that Amazon delivers to your readers. Um, it's like, why would Amazon do that? Is well because they know they know that this business works for authors. Mm -hmm. They want authors to be successful because that's how they make money. Yeah. Amazon's not gonna like nickel and dime dime you as much as you think they will. Like they have a they have a business that runs on nickel and diming, but at the same time they, they really want you to be successful because that's how they make money. And they're a big company, they don't know you, but they want authors to be successful yeah. on their platform, that's how they make money. So you have you can have permafree, and one of the things you can do if you're gonna write a series is you have book one permafree. Yeah. Zero dollars. And for zero dollars Anyone can come across that book and read it on like the variety of Amazon platforms that are delivered, including um, uh, KDP Select or or, um, or Kindle Unlimited is what I should say. Sorry, yeah. Kindle Unlimited is what KDP Select will put you into. Kindle Unlimited is a subscription service. 
you get paid by the page read, not by selling individual eBooks. Yeah. It's like Netflix for books. If you're it's like familiar. Netflix for books, and it works really good for a lot of readers. Uh, I have all my books are on Kindle Unlimited, and I make probably I probably make a similar amount of money on Kindle Unlimited than I do just selling the eBooks. Probably less, but it gets me reviews, and that's that's really for important. for a book that costs money. I need reviews. Mm-hmm. And so if somebody has zero dollar buy-in, they're always going to feel like they're getting value. That's the other thing. So you, you put it on perma-free and if someone's like, you know, it, lots of people are going to download it. Yeah. A lot of people are going to download it because they're like, it's zero dollars. You'd be surprised how people will not download a zero dollar book if it still looks like garbage. They won't even download it. Yeah. So if your cover sucks <laughs> and your, you know, and your description's bad, they won't even click it to see if it's zero dollars. Yeah. They'll see something, you know, but if they say like, well, that looks cool. It's zero dollars. They click it and it's like, looks really cool. They're like, I, I can't believe this is free today. And they'll yeah. buy it yeah. because the, the consumer doesn't realize it's not on like a special and then it's yeah. perma free. By the way, I'm running a special on Muramasa Blood Drinker right now. <laughs> it's zero dollars. If you're, if you're listening to this podcast, check the links in the SoundCloud description or go to, um, davidvstore.com and follow the links to, uh, Muramasa Blood Drinker. Um, from there, you can get it for zero dollars this weekend. So if you don't have it yet, now's your time to get it for free and uh, read it, review it, all that lovely good stuff. Um, anyway, so when a consumer sees a free book, they're going to immediately the value that you present is higher yeah. because you can't get a better deal than free. <laughs> and if they feel like they got a great story for free, they're going to feel really compelled to give you a good review. Yeah. And if they feel like you got a decent story for free. They're gonna they're gonna give you an extra star or two. Yeah, I've given extra stars to cheaper books because I felt like the value was there. Yeah, you know it's like you know this isn't uh, I, I had took some exceptions to the way this is written. It's still to me a four star book because for ninety nine cents it's an incredible value and it delivers these these elements really well. Yeah, you know and I've I've given those reviews before and I know that 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 affects consumer confidence. Is like oh this now for book two what do you charge? I'll just tell you, ninety nine cents or two ninety nine. <laughs> Take your pick. Yeah, it's and you gotta you gotta remember that you're still building your platform and you're still building your sales funnel, um, and you're always building the consumer confidence and you're al- always building your following. Um, until you've really done that, you, you can't afford to go higher. Yeah. And book two, so book two of your series is where readers are, have liked the first one enough that they're. And they felt like they got enough value from the free one that they're going to be willing to trade their money for book two. And that's where you're going to make your money. And that's part of like your funnel. Lots of people download the first one. Not everyone reads it. People see huge, you know, if you get a ton of reviews on that first book, you know, and and you could go on Amazon and and go research this yourself. Find an indie series and you'll find the first book will have a hundred reviews. Second book will have 10. Mm -hmm. That's normal. A lot less people, any amount of paywall, you're going to lose people yeah. versus free. You can't put everything perma-free. You'll never make money that way. There's a point, yeah. right? Um, so, But you want to have your second one, $0.99 cents or two ninety nine or one ninety nine, one of those price points. If you go above two ninety nine, and I had Muramasa Blood Drinker at four ninety nine for a long time. For reasons I'll explain. But <laughs> um, once you go higher than that, then the consumer has to really think about the value to a much greater degree. And that means the more they waffle on the decision, the longer they the longer they take to click one buy buy now with one click, yeah. the less chance you have of selling them on the book. Mm-hmm. That's just how it is. They're gonna waffle on the decision for five bucks. Yeah. I think Muramas is good enough that I'm okay with people waffling on it because of the genre. That if you're into samurai fiction, it's like, I really want to read this. Yeah. This has cursed blades and blood. On the well, and and this is uh, this is a mantra that Stu and I have lived by for a long time. Is that if there's ever any doubt, there is no doubt. So if people if people aren't sure that they're going to buy your book, they're not going to buy your book. Mm-hmm. So if you go to someone's author, if you go to someone's page and you see their book and you're like, eh, this is kind of interesting. If if there's ever any doubt, there is no doubt that they will not buy your book. Yeah. Um, now there's things that could push them to one side. Later. And one of those is, is price. And one of those is price. If they see it's ninety nine cents, they're like, mm, 
I'll take a chance. Yeah, and they're way more likely to take a chance for a buck than to take a chance for five dollars. Yeah. Or ten dollars. Ten dollars, people are gonna like hold off on buying it in the in the ebook market. Yeah. Uh, a nine ninety nine ebook, you gotta. I mean, it's gotta be really compelling to make yeah. people want to see the value in that. Yeah. You have to be. You know, not, there's a lot of nine ninety nine nonfiction books because nonfiction books sell sell value in themselves. So if you're writing a nonfiction book, you can think about pricing at $9.99. I'd still recommend you price it at $4.99 for a nonfiction book that's selling something that is valuable. Like yeah. if you're if you're selling a book like how to be how to be more productive, if, or if you're selling like a uh, any any kind of book that offers benefits, like you know how to pick up more chicks, how to make more money, uh, how to have uh, how to have a more efficient life, how to be more environmentally friendly by buying yeah. this ebook and yeah, not wasting then- the paper. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna cue into people's value signals, and that's that's the thing. You want to cue into people's value signals. Now, when you're writing fiction, the value signal is going to be different from person to person because if you don't like samurai fiction, it doesn't matter how great uh, how great story cover yeah. cover is or, or the description or what how good the story is. You're not cueing into that value. You're just like, oh, I don't really want to read something about Japan. Yes, <laughs> but if you're really into urban fantasy which urban fantasy has a really big market, then you have to make sure that you know what those cues are to, to signal value. Um, you know, now urban f- fantasy has a lot of subgenres, So some people just really like urban fantasy with werewolves, right? Some yeah. people just really like urban fantasy with romance. Some people just like, uh, and by the way, when, when a, when a consumer is searching in a genre, there's a little button they can click that says non-romantic. Yeah. So there's a non-romantic radio button, and uh, there's a radio button that says romantic. Mm-hmm. And so if they want a romance story, they're going to click that radio button, and you're going to want to find a way to cue into those keywords if that's yeah. what you're selling. Yeah, I mean, for me, I'm I'm writing urban urban fantasy that is non-romantic. So when I go look at urban fantasy. If that's all I do, it's just it's page after page of just paranormal romance. Um, <laughs> so that's I mean that is, that's important marketing information for me because if I want my readers to find me by by typing in urban fantasy, if urban fantasy is one of my keywords, I'm going to get lost in the mix. Yeah, what what you really need to do in in your case is find those readers who like Jim Butcher. And uh, get them to buy the book, and then anyone else who likes Jim Butcher, you're gonna have an, you're gonna have a. Also, people who bought this also bought this. Yeah. And uh, you'll might you might yeah. Book and that's on there. yeah, and that's part of the sales funnel. If you can get people who who look for Jim Butcher, or uh, I can't remember the name of the, of the author who did Sandman Slim. If, if if you can get related to big authors, then man, you're then, yeah, now you're, you've got a good a really sales good funnel. Field. So if if somebody clicks Shogun. They might see my book because somebody who read Shogun bought the ebook, might have bought Muramasa because they're in the same genre. And Shogun is like an international bestseller for like the last fifty years. Yeah. You know, it's a it's an incredibly popular book. So if somebody took a chance on that and they'd like, well, maybe I'll read another one. They might read mine, and that's that's pretty cool too. Uh, no, so so back to back to price points. Ninety nine cents is gonna. You're trying to offer value. So if you, once you get above two ninety nine, it's harder to offer the value unless somebody's really into what you're what you're selling. The other thing that I will I will comment on, and I'm not I'm not an expert on this, so I'm just going to throw this out as a, a thought, is it depends also on the amount of of capital you're investing into your launch and how quickly you are hoping to uh, make up that investment so yeah if so you, this is if you how, drop a bunch of money on advertising that i mean more people are going to see your book first of all that doesn't that doesn't necessarily translate to sales though. yeah because you want to you want those ads to convert to sales that's how you're actually going to make money yeah um, and so this that's a really really good thing to think about uh, we're starting to run out of time so i want to cover those other two formats but yeah. yeah, you need to think about your investment. If you spend three hundred bucks on a book cover and then you spend three hundred dollars on advertising, you have a six hundred dollar investment. 
how long how long are you willing to wait for that six hundred dollars to come back in? And really, it's not this isn't really a question because if you price your book at ten ninety nine, trying to make six hundred dollars back, you will never make it back. Yeah, yeah. Because the market just isn't willing to buy that product, no matter how much you invested in it. Mm-hmm. So your investment in the product does not determine what the market is willing to buy it for, and you need to accept that as reality. So if that means that people are only, in your genre, people are only going to buy a ninety nine cent ebook for you, that means you need to sell uh, how fifteen hundred copies to make back your investment. You better you better be working on getting those fifteen hundred copies, and you better yeah. be willing to wait a while to get those fifteen hundred copies to make the six hundred dollars back. Yeah. Especially when you're starting back, starting out. Somebody who's a bigger name and who really understands this game better, like they'll make their investment back the, the launch week, yeah. and that's that's great. But it takes probably takes a while to get there, and yeah. and you got to learn a lot about the the process before you're probably ready to do that. Um, I want to talk about two other formats. Um, that you will get pressured to do and you don't have to do them. One of them I recommend that you do um, from my experience and the other one I recommend caution towards. So the first one is paperback. So if you're publishing on Kindle, um, there's two options for creating a paperback. One is CreateSpace. CreateSpace is great. The other one is... This is still in beta right now, and I I have done it through beta, and it works really well. Just KDP paperbacks. It's the same thing. It comes out of the same place, but the you track you get to track the sales differently with the KDP one. You get a much better idea of how many paperbacks you're selling. Turns out I sell a lot of paperbacks, and that I really like that. I like yeah. to, a physical book sales to me are are just different. I prefer reading a physical book. I know other people do. And that means when somebody's done with that physical book, they can hand it to another person. Yeah. That physical book has its own weird little life. Yeah. Um, well, and and you might you might be like, well, wait, Stu, but isn't that piracy? No, it's <laughs> not. I don't care. Yeah. This but this is like because, I want people to read the story. Yeah. You want you're not going to make money on every on. Hopefully, lots of people will read your book and be more interested in reading more. Yeah. Reading more books, reading more books, buying more books. Yeah, the idea is it's a it's a long game. So to format a to format a, a paperback, it's not that much work once you know how to do it. You can basically format a paperback in Microsoft Word if you know what you're doing. You embed the font. You can do whatever pretty fonts you want. Um, there's a bunch of no nos to that. We'll do maybe we'll do another podcast just on doing paperbacks. But you should think about creating a paperback at the same time you create an ebook. Not everyone's going to buy the paperback. There'll be a couple sales, but the fact that you have a paperback offered at the same time as the ebook actually really cues into consumer confidence. They see that paperback available and they immediately think that you're serious business and that increases their value perception of what you're offering. Um, if it's just an ebook and there's nothing else available, they are going to think you're just some person and you are just some, some person. But like, they're not going to think that you're a serious writer. Yeah. Uh, but if you offer that paperback at the same time, and make it good, um, and if you're paying for cover design, make sure that part of that cover design includes includes the design of a paperback, and get the paperback. And the thing about KDP paperbacks, just like with the eBooks, you can revise you can revise it if you want to. Yeah. So, um, you know, you can change. I've changed my paperback cover one time to like fix a couple of little things that I, I didn't think came out perfectly. Um, including like just kind of a odd wording in, in one of the, in like the, the blurb on the back. Um, so I, I fixed some stuff on that and you can also fix the content file pretty easily. If you have the content file in word and you find a typo, you fix the typo, you resubmit it and then all other feature print on demand stuff will, will have that fixed. So it's just like it's just like dealing with an ebook now, but it comes out as a paperback, which is great. I really do recommend you do it. It, it I think it cues in a consumer confidence big time. And there's people who would prefer to buy a paperback. You're serving that market. They're like, I don't really want to do an ebook. I really want a paperback, and they'll buy the paperback, and that's great. And then Amazon will mail the paperback to them in three days. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. The the other one is Audible. Audible. Well, Audible. Au- audiobooks. Audiobooks. Yeah. Audible's the, the company that you want to do audiobooks through. You can do iTunes with the same thing. Um, 
But the, once you have the formatting for Audible down, you can just do it on i. You can just put it on iTunes, yeah. um, without any, without having to really change anything. You have to change like two things, and you're going to do that through what's called ACX, which is the audiobook exchange that Amazon runs. Uh, they have a business where you can offer, find voice actors that will do your audiobook, and negotiate price and that sort of stuff. The thing is, it's a big expense to pay somebody to record an audiobook especially if your book is long. So my, like Muramasa, I haven't put out an, I put out an audio book for a short, for a short uh, novella called Yermesh and the Farmer. And I put out that audio book mainly to learn how to do audiobooks. And I recorded it myself because um, I use my voice have, all the time. You and have the skills. I have the to, skills to read it. Um, not to, to record it, really. I have skills to record it, yeah. And the equipment. That's going to be the, that's going to be the, the the gap for most people is they don't have they don't have the audio engineering. Um, yeah, so I have an audio engineering background, so it's easy for me to record it. Um, even so, I haven't done Muramasa because it's it's going to be twenty hours of work, and I just haven't just had to 20, read the book. Yeah, just to read the book and 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 make the files because even though it's a ten hour audio book, it probably takes double that time to do all the micro editing to make it sound perfect. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not that it's not that it's that hard. It's just I haven't had twenty hours. I haven't had 20 hours to do crap. You guys are getting a, a lot of value with my time right now. <laughs> so I, I actually, I recommend not, not doing audiobooks until you really, really establish yourself because any competent voice actor is going to charge a decent amount of money to do the work. Yeah. And there's a lot of great voice actors out there. Um, we're, we're talking, it's it's going to be quite a bit. Either you're basically, all the money you'd make from audiobooks is just going to pay them. Yeah. Like, if it costs $500 to record an audiobook, that's actually a lot of time for the actor to sit there and read. Yeah. Um, that's a long time to recover that investment. We're talking, you'd have to be, you'd have to be doing as much audiobook sales in terms of money as... Um, as you would do in all other formats, yeah, in, in all your formats combined, which is which is hard, man. That's really hard. Um, I would I would say that it could be a good investment if even if even if you're not making money on it, all you're doing is is getting a uh, paying back your investment, which won't happen with your first book. But if if that's all you get, then you're you're increasing your your long tail. You're getting more people interested in your yourself as an author. Yeah. Um, still wouldn't recommend it right away. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's a big expense. You don't need to add to that expense. You're not going to sell that many eBooks or I mean, I mean, uh, audio books. Um, it's really hard to market audio books. It's almost impossible to market them, market them the way that you do other books because, um, people buy them differently and people really haven't figured out the market other than Amazon. Amazon knows how to make money on it, but authors just, I keep every time I talk to an author, they're like I don't know how to make money on on audiobooks. I'm I'm like I have an audiobook and I don't really make money on it. Yeah. You know, it just I don't. It's it's not a it's not a it's not a thing. I've had like two people buy it, yeah. Um, and yeah. yeah. <laughs> so all right. Well, we're out of time, so uh, we didn't. I think did we, got, did we got get to, everything? Pretty much got to everything. Yeah, we got all the big pricing stuff. We got perma free, how you should generally price ebooks, avoid the nine ninety nine temptation. Just because you worked really hard on something doesn't mean the market's willing to pay for it. Yeah. You need to divorce the idea that your investment automatically means a price. It yeah. doesn't. The yeah. price is determined by the market. Your investment you have to determine ahead of time to figure out where your yeah. where your profit margin is. And that means if you have to design the cover yourself and invest time in learning that, or if you have to record an audiobook yourself. Don't record an audiobook yourself unless you have good equipment and you know how to run at least Reaper. Cheapest cheapest way to do that would be to buy like a Yeti and um, get Reaper for 60 bucks. Now, now you're at like a $300 investment anyway, just to yeah. get the equipment and yeah. the software and then learn how to use it. Probably not a good <laughs> idea unless, you, unless you're Stu and you already know how to do this stuff like second nature. Because I've been recording, I've been recording music for 20 years. Um, it's probably just not a good idea to try to do that yourself. Um, I'll do it myself. That's it. All right, that's it. We're done. We're done. You can find me at matthewjwellman.com. Find me at davidvstewart.com, dvspress.com. Muramasa Blood Drinker is available for free this weekend, up through May 14th, I think. All right. Have a great one. See you.